really excited to talk to you guys today about accessibility. Um, specifically, how to build accessible React components. So let's get started. So as I mentioned, my name is Kat Johnson. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, and I specialize in front-end web development. And I am specifically very passionate about creating accessible React components. So with all of my work and my day-to-day -day stuff, I always love building websites and experiences that really tie into areas that I'm really passionate about. Some of the areas I'm really passionate about is anti-racist leadership, creating accessible and inclusive experiences, and overall just really creating web experiences that create social impact and social change for the good of, I guess, all mankind. <laughs> Today for my talk, I'm gonna be focusing on one of these areas that I'm really, I really love, which is accessibility. So let's get started on what is accessibility. My clicker, come on. All right, there we go. So what is accessibility? Well, accessibility essentially means the ability to access. And specifically, typically, accessibility focuses on enabling societal and communal services and tools for people with disabilities. So if you're going about your day to day, imagine you're playing, or not playing, watching Netflix. If you turn on those closed captioning and those subtitles, that's an accessible and assistive tool. Or imagine today, you're walking into this conference area, walking into the Hilton, you probably notice a lot of those power automated doors. All of that functionality is assistive tools that we see and interact with on our day to day. Now, when I began my work as a software engineer, I was really, really excited to start working on experiences and really focusing on accessibility. I was so pumped to build experiences that were accessible, inclusive, and I felt really jazzed at, okay, I can do this. I know how to create an accessible experience. I should be able to do it. But as a lot of you have probably experienced, accessibility isn't always straightforward. There's a lot of frustrations I experienced. There's a lot of uncertainty about how to verify whether your experience is accessible, what tools you should be using. And if you work in an organization, you have a lot of tight deadlines. It's hard to prioritize getting accessibility d bugs done and integrating that into experience early on. Also, depending on your, on your company, you, there might be a substantial lack of investment into the area. There's no accessibility experts nearby to give you advice or feedback, so you can sometimes feel really lost. But here's the main thing. I think we can all agree that when we go into our work, we're not really going into creating our web experience thinking, I want it to be inaccessible. <laughs> we don't want to like, create tools that aren't inclusive of the other people. So we all want to create these really accessible, inclusive experiences. We just need to know how we're going to go about it. So I hope today in my talk we can kind of dig into some aspects to make for a really inclusive and accessible web components. Now before I really dig in, I just want to make a note that if you're using a lot of React frameworks or React component libraries, like Remix, shout out, you're probably not going to experience any issues with accessibility if you're just using those low-level components. If you're using a lot of stuff out of the box, there's already going to be a lot of accessibility baked into the component and the tools you're using. This talk, what will be really helpful, is thinking about if you're trying to create really custom components that are creating something that's a little more dynamic, that's not something you can easily produce out of the box. So this will be really helpful if you're ever working on a component library and trying to create your own components. So let's dig in a little bit. The first question I want you all to ask yourselves whenever you're trying to create a new React component is how will this component be used? Are you creating a list? Are you creating a list experience? Is there going to be a lot of static content that a user is going to need to read information from? Maybe it also include some links. Maybe you're also trying to create some buttons. Maybe you're creating a nav menu that has a lot of a lot of buttons up top that navigate throughout your website. These are important, important questions to ask yourself in the beginning because it will help you determine what ARIA role you should be setting. So what's an ARIA role? Essentially, ARIA roles provide semantic meaning to the content that you're creating. 
it allows screen readers and other assistive tools to be able to understand what it is that they're navigating. So if you're navigating with a screen reader or another assistive tool, the difference between I'm navigating a list and I'm navigating a button is completely different experiences. One notifies you that you're perusing static content. The other, it's an interactive experience where if I hit enter, I might change the state of the page. Now, setting the ARIA role is not going to make your whole experience accessible from the beginning. There's still going to be some more ARIA attributes you're going to need to set and modify. But starting with the ARIA role will set you up for success in the long run. So let's look at some of those examples of what that might look like. So from our earlier examples, if I'm trying to create a list component uh, in React, I'll just say, here's my list component. In my HTML, I'm just going to set role to list. And similarly, if I'm creating a button component, all I have to do is set that role to button. Now, this is a very simplistic example. Um, I would highly recommend, before you start modifying roles, that you try and make use of HTML um, functionality, like the button tag or the list tags, if, you, if that makes sense. But if you're creating really custom components where you need to use divs, spans, and other um, generic uh, HTML content, it's really critical to set that list, or set the list, set the role property, so then, this, so then when users navigate your page, they understand what they are navigating. So here's some different roles I've used within my work. Um, I use the button role a lot, radio, link, there are so many different ARIA roles online. I can't really list them all out here. Um, so I encourage you, if you're curious about all the different role attributes for an experience you're trying to build, you can look online on waiaria.com and look up all the various different roles and functionality we have available to really ingrain your experience and accessibility. I'm taking a sip of water, one second. All right, cool. So now let's segue on to tap stops and programmatically setting focus. So who here has used tap stops before? OK, got like a few, a few people who know. Perfect. So tap stops are really important for accessibility. Essentially what tap stops are is that it's a way of navigating the page by hitting the tab key on your keyboard. This is really important because so many users use the keyboard experience to navigate pages, whether they're screen reader user, users or users with like physical mobility and they use the tab key to navigate. It's really helpful whenever you're creating a navigation experience and tab keys that they generally follow the order and the flow of the page. As you can see with this example of a site that I work on a lot during work, it's Microsoft uh, account.microsoft.com that in general, our tab order follows the flow of the page, starting with the top with the nav menu, and then working its way down the bottom of the page. It should generally follow the flow of the page. Um, one thing to note about tab stops is that you always want it to be on interactive content. You really don't want to put the tab, ex uh, tab key for it to hover over text. We want the tab focus to only go to interactive content. So as you can see with the example, it mostly navigates to buttons, links, and other interactive content. Now, say for instance, you're creating experience. Let's go back to the button example. You have a button. You put it on the page. It works pretty well. But for some reason, you can't tab to it. It's not snapping to it like you thought it would. And it's not working like you expect. Well, there's some things we can do there to improve that. So if you ever have any issues with tabbing, the thing I want you to always remember is tab index equals 0. What tab index equals 0 does is that it essentially takes your component and adds it to the tab order of the whole web page. Uh, there's other things you can kind of fiddle around with there, like tab index equals negative 1. But for the purpose of this talk, I really want you to remember how to use tab index equals 0, as it's a critical tool that I use all the time in my work. But say you use tab key, uh, tab index equals zero, and it doesn't work for some whatever reason. Well, there's some other things we can try to do to get your focus to work. 
One thing you can use within React is the React ref property. All you have to do is create a React ref, pass that into your component, and then after a certain action or after a certain event, you can hit, you can uh, write the line current dot focus, and then your content will get focused for the user. This is a really important and powerful tool, uh, and I recommend you use it sparingly. <laughs> Really try to use that tab index equals zero because if you try and use React Ref too often, it can potentially create a janky experience for your customers where they might be interacting with some content, an event happens, and if they snap all the way across the page, it can feel a little jarring. So use this experience very sparingly, only if necessary, and please use tab index equals zero over this every time. So now I want to segue to talking about properties we're exposing when we're creating components. And specifically, I want us to ask the question, how will my component be used? Because that's really going to determine what properties we want to expose, and specifically, accessible properties. So for instance, if I'm creating a component and it's only going to be used once on my website on one page within one frame of context, I'm probably not going to expose any accessibility properties. As you can see here, if this is uh, for some button properties, I'm just exposing the text for my button. I've already baked in the accessible experience within the component, so there's no need to expose that for anyone else to modify or update the accessibility properties. But let's say my component is being not used in one location, but in multiple locations across my website. That means I'm going to have to periodically update it to denote the context of which it's being used. So in that case, I might expose a few ARIA attributes and other accessible attributes to modify it for where the location is at. So in this example, I expose the ARIA label because it's very helpful to update that with the label. And then let's say you are building a component that's going to be used across multiple websites in multiple locations. Maybe you're taking Remix and you're building upon it and creating your own component library. You might want to, not might, you will really need to expose as many accessible properties as you can. That's because you won't be able to predict or foresee all the different locations that this experience is going to be used in. So it's really important to allow users to modify it in multiple ways. One great example of this is in my own work. Um, I built out a button experience that I believe was very accessible. It worked on multiple of our partners' websites really well. But we started noticing that a lot of partners were using buttons as links. So when uh, screen reader users were navigating to the experience, they would hover over the button they click the button and it would toggle and navigate to a new page. For that experience, it's actually much more helpful for it to be denoted as a link experience, since now users can navigate and understand that if I click this button or click this thing that I'm hovering over, it is going to navigate me to a new page. So for my experience, it was really helpful to expose the role property. Even, even once I was sure that was a button, it was important to expose the role property. So future developers could use it and modify it to work with links. So that's a lot of the functionality for how to build things in React, in React components. Now I want to segue a little bit into talking about more ways we can be accessible and other tools you can incorporate into your development process to create an accessible experience. One way, one thing I highly recommend, and if you forget anything for this talk, like if you forget all the stuff about React components and how to make them accessible, the one thing I want you to remember is to please use automated accessibility scans. These automated tools are one of the main ways that I'm able to confirm and validate that I am creating an accessible experience. You can pipe them into your CI CD pipeline or other um, in your pull requests. And so it'll automatically check and verify that your code is accessible. So you're not f falling into some 90, about 90% of the bugs that plague the website. Um, there's also a lot of browser extensions. Um, these are some of the accessibility tools that I use in my browser at work. Uh, accessibility Insights for the web, 
a Microsoft tool, I'll admit. <laughs> Uh, and I also use AxeCore Ax web extensions. Uh, I don't know if anyone went to uh, AxeCon. That was earlier this year. Uh, it's online. It's free. Highly recommend it. I learned a lot from that talk as well. And one thing I would love to recommend to everyone here is explore assistive tools and technology. I recommend playing around with screen readers, maybe modifying the color contrast settings in Windows. Try, um, I think there's this new product from Microsoft called Voice Access. That thing's pretty cool. Um, but play around with a lot of these tools and get to know what our customers use to navigate our websites. Because then it'll help you get more understanding about how these experiences are interacted with, and thus you can create more accessible experiences. Uh, I do want to add a caveat, though, is to be careful whenever you're using these accessible tools. Um, I know for myself, when I first got into accessibility, I was really excited to use screen readers. I tabbed around. I used arrow keys. And there was a few times where I assumed that an experience was inaccessible. And I filed a bug, and I investigated, only to find out that I just used screen readers incorrectly and filed a bug on myself. <laughs> So I highly recommend that while I encourage you to explore these tools and test them out for yourself, also try and pad your experience with maybe some, some training to help or use them with a grain of salt, if anything, to experience what other tools p customers are using. So one thing I hope you all take away from this presentation is accessibility can be a lot easier. It's up to all of us to share our knowledge around accessibility and ways for us to create more accessible, inclusive experiences. And yeah, it, it can be so much easier. And I hope we can all work together to create more accessible and more inclusive experiences. Click. All right. Here are some of the resources I've used for my talk. Uh, shout out to Remix and their accessibility guidelines, which I use for this presentation. Also, React has some great accessibility forms that I also used. And shout out to one of my coworkers, Sarah Higley. Um, she's helped me with many accessibility bugs that were really challenging. And if you want to see more from me, um, I have a website. I do not have Twitter or Instagram, though maybe I should. <laughs> but you can check me out on my website called catinthemachines.com. Um, I'm also in the process of trying to create a podcast to talk about accessibility and socially impacting technology. Um, coming soon, summer, fall, whenever I have time between work and doing conferences. Um, so please shout out to me and reach out if you have any questions. And thank you so much for listening to my talk, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and the rest of the conference.